Beyond the darkness. Beyond the grave. Lies a new dimension. Is it something real, or is it something imagined? Hello, I'm Patrick McNee. You know the eerie feeling you get? Join host Patrick McNee, along with Susan O'Leary Hull, as they reach into the realm of the unknown. Relive poltergeist nightmares. Investigate ghosts suspended in time. Age-old hauntings in the Tower of London. Haunted hotels and strange clues left by the spirit world. From the bizarre to the unnerving, journey with us into the world of ghost stories. Ghost stories aren't just for the campfire anymore. Beyond the darkness, beyond the grave, to an unexplored dimension as we travel to the mysterious realm of ghosts. Journey with us into the world of ghost stories. Patrick McNee. Thanks for joining me as we explore the depths of Hollywood. Not the side of Tinseltown's glitter and glamour, but the mysterious, often untold side where famous lives are ravished by tragedy and terror. And even screen legends are caught in the bizarre limbo which lies beyond this dimension. Stories abound here. Ours live here. Our subject is ghosts. As he requested, Bela Lugosi was buried in the cape of Count Dracula, the very character that caused him so much personal torment. Perhaps that is why Bela Lugosi's ghost still lingers strolling down Hollywood Boulevard, we're told, the one place where he was at his happiest and at the top of his career. Elizabeth Short's murder was horrifying. A girl who would otherwise have vanished in the Hollywood maze became famous by way of her sadistic killing. To make the whole thing more bizarre, more than 50 people confessed to this lurid crime. Marilyn called for a press conference. I'll never believe she was uh, a suicide. The day before the press conference, Marilyn was found dead. She's been sighted at her grave, the Hotel Roosevelt, and the house where she lived at the time of her death. Hollywood is the kind of place where anything can happen and where everything is possible. And once you have made it to the top, the sky is the limit. Not that the sky ever stopped anyone in Hollywood. Mansions you could only find between the pages of a Gothic novel adorn tree-lined streets. In these mansions, many a film star from yesteryear lived a dream come true. Or so it appeared to the outside world. How many of Tinseltown's dark secrets are left untold, we will never know. Leaving you with only one wish. If only those walls could talk. 
Motion pictures have provided us with some terrifying tales. Stories that had us on the edge of our seats and our hearts pounding furiously. So, it's only fair to start with some of the film stars who took mystery one step further. Especially those stars who aren't around anymore. Or so we are led to believe. Silent screen idol Lon Chaney portrayed the haunted characters so well in films such as The Hunchback of Notre Dame and The Phantom of the Opera, so it came as no great surprise when a rumor flared up that Lon Chaney's ghost was spotted in Hollywood after his death in 1930. In his living years, Chaney, like so many other actors starting out, earned money as a movie extra. Every day at the corner of Hollywood and Vine, he sat on a bench waiting for the bus to take him to the studios. Years later, when stardom entered the picture, Chaney would drive by that bench and give a ride to the movie extras waiting for their chance. Eventually, the corner of Hollywood and Vine lost its original glamour, but it was here where Lon Chaney's ghost has been spotted sitting on the bench as if waiting. For what? Nobody will ever know. In 1942, a new bench replaced the original old one. Lon Chaney's ghost was never seen again. As he requested, Bela Lugosi was buried in the Cape of Count Dracula, the very character that caused him so much personal torment. Perhaps that is why Bela Lugosi's ghost still lingers strolling down Hollywood Boulevard, we're told, the one place where he was at his happiest and at the top of his career. See if you can spot any evidence of supernatural phenomena in this photograph. Whether or not you believe in ghosts, there seem to be enough tales out there to leave at least a thread of reasonable doubt. Experts say, though, that ghosts feed on the energy from the living to manifest themselves. So people who don't believe in ghosts aren't able to give out that energy and rarely witness this phenomenon. Another star who held audiences around the world in a grip of terror was Bella Lugosi, best known for his infamous portrayal of Count Dracula. I am Dracula. I bid you welcome. Lugosi's checkered past revealed that he was in actual life born close to the same place from which Count Dracula originated, Transylvania. It was also rumored that Lugosi's drug abuse was the direct result of him being typecast as Count Dracula. Lugosi could never shake the image. At the age of 71, he died of a heart attack, lonely, penniless, and forgotten. As he requested, Bela Lugosi was buried in the cape of Count Dracula, the very character that caused him so much personal torment. Perhaps that is why Bela Lugosi's ghost still lingers strolling down Hollywood Boulevard, we're told, the one place where he was at his happiest and at the top of his career. During the golden era in Hollywood, the Hotel Roosevelt was the place to be. Everyone who was anyone frequented the hotel. Beautiful faces, designer dresses, and pressed tuxedos filled the rooms. Few people outside of the Hollywood glitz were privy to what went on inside. Today, the Hotel Roosevelt has been restored to its original splendor, giving tourists a glimpse of old Hollywood. 
Some say that if you're fortunate, you might even spot the odd film star. From long ago, we might add. Perhaps Montgomery Clift wasn't out to scare his audiences senseless, but after his death, he certainly changed that. So it is here, at the Hotel Roosevelt, that Montgomery Clift stayed for three months in 1952 during the making of From Here to Eternity. His room number was 928. Rehearsing his lines and playing the bugle, he would stroll the hallway on the ninth floor for hours at a stretch. It comes as no surprise, then, that the sound of a bugle echoing through the walls of the ninth floor long after Montgomery's death left one to draw only one conclusion. Terrell Valazza was a worker at the Hotel Roosevelt after the grand reopening in 1986. First week here, it was good. The end of the, the beginning of the second week, is when I was getting off the ninth floor elevator and I was walking down the hall and I heard footsteps behind me. I turned around to see if there was anybody following me and there was nobody there. And then as I was continuing to walk, I felt a cold, a cold breeze like walk right by me. went down in the elevator and never went back up. Terrell's experience is only one of many that happened on the ninth floor near room 928. There are no hard and fast rules about how, why and where ghosts will manifest themselves. Many experts believe, though, that a traumatic death is a sure way to guarantee a haunting especially if the dead person was not ready to be accepted in the spiritual world. Emphasizing the sparkle and grandeur of Tinseltown below, the Hollywood sign lights up Mount Lee for everyone to see and a silent promise to many a hopeful. A frantic call to police one night reported a sighting of a young woman climbing up one of the letters, the letter H. But when the police arrived, there was no one there. Yet another report came in a week later. The description fits the same young woman climbing up the same letter. But again, a search proved in vain, as though she had vanished into thin air. The case was more than puzzling because precautions had been taken to keep people from climbing up these letters. There was only one incident many years ago when a careless workman left his ladder behind. Of all the forgotten suicides in Hollywood, there is none more tainted with ill-conceded fate than that of the young actress who surrendered so dramatically to her circumstances. Peg Entwistle, like so many other aspiring actors, came to Hollywood with expectations of stardom. Unlike many, she had a lot to offer, but her talent still got lost in the grooves of the Hollywood mill. Finally, at the end of her rope, Peg Entwistle climbed the steep slope toward the Hollywood sign on the night of September the 18th, 1932. At the 50-foot letter H, she scaled the ladder to the very top. How long she stood there, watching the twinkling lights of the powerful movie studios below, no one will ever know. But eventually, Peg Entwistle leapt to her death. There is a heartbreaking twist, however. What Peg Entwistle didn't know was that at the time of her suicide, a note was in the mail to her from the Beverly Hills community players, offering her a prime role in their next stage production, that of a young woman who commits suicide at the end of the third act. Nicky Hilton was perhaps better known for being married to Elizabeth Taylor. I knew him as a young man, Nicky Hilton. The people tell us Hilton committed suicide here. It was at that home, during a party, that Jack walked into the study to use the telephone. And I peeked in him like, there he was sitting at the desk. Can you spot any evidence of supernatural phenomena in this photograph? Thank <laughs> you. 
Nicky Hilton was perhaps better known for being married to Elizabeth Taylor than being a hotel magnet. I knew him as a young man, Nicky Hilton. I, had, I was with him on his honeymoon to Liz Taylor, and he was about the strangest, weirdest kid I'd ever met. The Jimmy Dean of millionaires, you know? The people tell us Hilton committed suicide here. It was at that home, during a party, that Jack walked into the study to use the telephone. And I peeked in, and I got, there he was sitting at the desk. I mean, I mean, it's, it's you know, made your hair stand on end. I, I kind of bolted out, you know. But that's not where the peculiar evening ended. Sometime later, we had been invited over to the house, and our hostess had taken me upstairs and shown me the bedroom. The carpeting was stained with blood. It was the same room where Nicky Hilton years before had slashed his wrists. And the strange thing was, no matter how many times the carpeting had been replaced, the blood stains kept coming back. While we were examining the carpet, our hostess's daughter called to the room on the intercom. Something really strange was happening in the kitchen. While well, we rushed down there wondering what could be causing such a fright, that something was definitely shaking the liquor cabinet. I mean, from the inside, we, we, we thought maybe a cat had gotten in there, but after our hostess unlocked it, all the shaking stopped and there was nothing unusual at all about it. She then closed the bar and locked it and everything went crazy. Liquid came pouring out, bottles were shaking. I was scared to death. He and I looked at each other. We were both panic stricken. Oh, it was frightening, especially the no noise and rattling and shaking. A bottle, you know, actually hearing something. And you think maybe it's a tremor, an earthquake, or what, or some, some kind of a gag. Or, you know, like right on cue, everything, things would happen constantly in that house. Elizabeth Short's murder was horrifying. A girl who would otherwise have vanished in the Hollywood maze became famous by way of her sadistic killing. To make the whole thing more bizarre, more than 50 people confessed to this lurid crime. See if you can spot any evidence of supernatural phenomena in this photograph. One can only presume that the ghosts of murder victims are some of the more restless spirits. And with a history littered with unfulfilled dreams and sensational murders, Hollywood offers a smorgasbord of such bizarre anecdotes. When James Maul entered the elevator at the Biltmore Hotel one evening, someone was already inside. A woman dressed in black from head to toe. A very pretty woman, standing quietly in the corner, never looking up. The elevator stopped on the sixth floor. James stepped to the side, expecting the woman to get out, but she remained inside. This is the sixth floor, he said, and smiled. As the woman brushed past him, James felt a sudden chill grazing his skin. Stopping outside the elevator, the woman looked back at James as if to ask him for help. He waited for her to say something, but she didn't. Just before the elevator door finally closed, he pressed the button to reopen them. And when James looked up, out into the hallway, there was no one there. As if there never was. James couldn't shake the peculiar sensation that had swept over him. A few days later, James stumbled across a book on Hollywood. Thumbing through, he happened to see a familiar face on page 52, the photograph of a pretty young woman dressed in black. James recognized his companion from the elevator. There was only one little snitch. She had been dead 
for half a century. Her story is tragic. And even in Hollywood's world of bizarre sex and crime stories, Elizabeth Short's murder was horrifying. On a cold morning in January 1947, a Los Angeles mother and her little girl stumbled across what looked like a broken store dummy lying among the rubble in a vacant lot. It turned out to be a naked body of a young woman, sword in half. Mutilated beyond comprehension, the body was covered with cigarette burns, the wrists and ankles in bondage, the mouth slashed into a grim sneer. Pathologists revealed the worst case scenario. There were indications that the victim's torture had lasted for three days, during which she was conscious most of the time. Nearly all the fingertips were sliced off. Prints of the remaining fingers were sent off to the FBI in Washington, D.C. The victim was identified. Elizabeth Short was a 22-year-old white female with black hair and blue eyes. Distinctive marks, a rose to two on the left thigh. She was born in Massachusetts to a middle-class family. Nothing significant stood out from her childhood except a minor record as a juvenile delinquent. At the age of 18, she set out for the bright lights of Hollywood. Four years later, she became an overnight sensation. A girl who would otherwise have vanished in the Hollywood maze became famous by way of her sadistic killing. The spectacular interest in the case made the investigation difficult. The number of suspects grew by the minute. In fact, to make the whole thing more bizarre, more than 50 people confessed to this lurid crime. Elizabeth Short was a rare beauty, even among the thousands of young women who flocked to Tinseltown with stars in their eyes. It's her idea of dressing totally in black that made her stand out in the crowd. She especially liked sensuous black sheath dresses, black stockings, black shoes, and black lingerie, consequently earning her the nickname the Black Dahlia. Investigation revealed more. Her social life ranged from the adventurous to utterly dangerous. There was no doubt that the Black Dahlia used her sexy figure and pretty face to her full advantage. Her ambition of becoming a movie star soon slipped into a hazy dream never realized. Bars and nightclubs were her havens. There she met hundreds of men with whom she shared more than just a casual drink. It was in one of these clubs where she met a married man, the last man seen with her before the murder. Together, they spent half the night drinking and the rest of the time in a local motel. The man said that afterwards he dropped her off at the Biltmore Hotel in Los Angeles. His story was confirmed, and he was dismissed as a suspect. The Black Dahlia's trail ended at the Biltmore Hotel, five days before her body was discovered. What happened in those five days remains a mystery. A letter was sent to the Los Angeles press after the murder. A strange letter if there ever was one. Words clipped from newspapers were pasted together, composing the brief message, here are Dahlia's belongings. Letter will follow. An address book, birth certificate, and social security card were enclosed with the letter, providing undeniable evidence. They all belonged to Elizabeth Short. The notepaper on which the letter was written was smudged with fingerprints. It was sent to the FBI. Despite a thorough search, no matching prints could be found. The writer also failed to send the promised follow-up letter. 
Even the address book filled with so many names failed to give them a new lead. There was one peculiar thing, though. A page had been ripped from the Black Dahlia's little black book before it was mailed. What was on this missing page? Or rather, whose name was on that page? Could it have been the name everyone was looking for? Another suspect was a young corporal in the US Army taken into custody after he was bragging about his kinky sexual encounter with the Black Dahlia. Suspicious bloodstains were found on his clothes and in his locker, as well as newspaper clippings about the murder. But his story turned out to be another hoax. Every time a new lead was picked up, it fizzled out shortly after. The killer was never found. Elizabeth Short's dream of becoming famous was indeed a dream come true. The price was just too high. To come back to James Maul's encounter with the mysterious woman in black, there is no doubt in his mind the woman was a dead ringer for the Black Dahlia, leading to the conclusion that the Black Dahlia's spirit lingers where the riddle ends. Joan Crawford called a local minister to perform an exorcism on the house. Some say it was in vain. Her daughter, Christina Crawford, recalled her mother's dying words, don't you dare ask God to help me. Can you spot any evidence of supernatural phenomena in this photograph? Most ghosts or hauntings are innocent enough. There are those which perforate the very essence of their surroundings. Our next story takes us to the very place Joan Crawford called home. But was Crawford the only occupant there? When children's voices continually echoed through the walls, their small shadows scaling the hallways, Joan Crawford called a local minister to perform an exorcism on the house. Some say it was in vain, because the evil spirits had already taken possession of the actress. Her daughter, Christina Crawford, recalled her mother's dying words. Don't you dare ask God to help me. After the death of Joan Crawford, the house remained hexed. They say one only has to walk through the hallways to feel a chill crawl down your spine. Fires erupt out of nowhere. And yet there is no one there. The people who bought the house in later years all suffered mental stress. And even another exorcism didn't do anything to alleviate the problem. Now, the only question that remains is whether the spirits are strangers or whether it is, perhaps, Joan Crawford herself. Marilyn called for a press conference. I'll never believe she was uh, a suicide. The day before the press conference, Marilyn was found dead. She's been sighted at her grave, the Hotel Roosevelt, and the house where she lived at the time of her death. See if you can spot any evidence of supernatural phenomena in this photograph. Thank you. 
One would expect a ghost story or two to attach itself to someone as celebrated as Marilyn Monroe, for this is one spirit who has every reason to be restless. Strange tales and tabloid gossip ran amok after the death of Marilyn Monroe. Evidence to her death became privy to only a few, and until today remains behind closed doors. The word sent out to the world was that Marilyn Monroe had committed suicide. For so many, this was a bitter pill to swallow. George Barris, author and close friend of Marilyn, was one of them. Don't forget, uh, the coroner's report was not uh, a complete report. The police department of Los Angeles, uh, for some reason, did not divulge everything. The president's office did not divulge everything. All of a sudden, her telephone records disappeared. It was a well-known fact that Marilyn Monroe and J.F. Kennedy, president of the United States, were more than good friends. Peter Lawford, the president's brother-in-law, made his house available for the couple. It was an open secret, you know, they had dinners there and uh, they had rendezvous there. Unfortunately for Marilyn, it was the beginning of a destructive path and incredible heartbreak. When the FBI got wind of the affair, the president was confronted. The FBI had enough evidence to incriminate Jack Kennedy. It was also a well-known fact that there was no love lost between J. Edgar Hoover, who was head of the FBI, and Jack Kennedy. Jack asked brother Bobby to handle the situation. Bobby was to tell Marilyn that the affair was over. Marilyn felt betrayed by Jack's cool and deliberate rejection of her. Rumors of a nervous breakdown circulated. Throughout Marilyn's ordeal, Bobby Kennedy remained at her side, giving her the support and friendship she so desperately needed. Inevitably, the relationship between Bobby and Marilyn led to a serious love affair. This time, J. Edgar Hoover's obsession completely overruled all reason. What if Bobby leaked classified information to Marilyn in those vulnerable moments of passion? Pressured, Bobby had no choice but to end the affair. Once again, Marilyn was ditched by a Kennedy. Marilyn called for a press conference. And there was only one side to the story, and it was about time that she told her side. The day before the press conference, Marilyn was found dead. I'll never believe she was uh, a suicide, never. What was Marilyn going to say at the press conference? Or rather, who would have been affected by her statement? She never suspected anything like this would ever happen to her. So it was just a tragedy. An unsolved tragedy is the world's greatest to an innocent girl. Tragedy, innocence, death, unsolved mystery all textbook examples of why a spirit would be troubled. And Marilyn's ghost certainly is. She's been sighted at her grave, the Hotel Roosevelt, and the house where she lived at the time of her death. There's a lot of people that I think are still alive that could enlighten us on this if they would only come forward, but uh, I think they're afraid to. One way or the other, Marilyn will remain an enigma a vivid reminder of stardom taking the low road. Once the site of extravagant Hollywood parties is the residue of what used to be a magnificent estate, 
frequented by stars such as Errol Flynn. After passing through the wrought iron gates of the pines, a crumbled path leads to the foundation and a staircase. All that's left of what was once a mansion one could only find in Hollywood. As expected, strange sightings have been reported, figures appearing and disappearing. Sometimes the faint sound of laughter and music still penetrate the quiet air. And when your curiosity takes over and you search for the party, you will find nothing. One is warned against going there at night because that's when the stars come out to continue where they had left off decades ago. Perhaps the greatest mystery in life is what happens after life. And maybe we will never get the answer. But there are the theories. One theory is if people don't believe there is anything after this life, death may be a confusing and unacceptable journey for them when they leave Earth for the spirit world. So along the way, they get lost. Gordy is perhaps the best way to describe the house Jane Mansfield bought in Bel Air. The star had the 13 bathroom mansion painted a flashy pink, and her love for the place was evident. Next to the swimming pool, Jane Mansfield has been spotted basking in the sun, long after her death, and a more shapely ghost one could not wish to see. There is, however, a tragic story that precedes Jane Mansfield's death. Her boyfriend at the time, Sam Brody, convinced her to join a satanic church in Beverly Hills. The priest of the coven, Anton LaVey, became furious when Brody and Mansfield mocked some of the rituals. It is said LaVey put a curse on Mansfield. When Mansfield's five-year-old son was mangled by a lion at Jungle Land in Thousand Oaks, she took the curse seriously and went to LaVey and pleaded with him to save her son. Her son recovered, but Mansfield's bad luck continued. Rumor had it that Satan was at work here because on June the 29th, 1966, Mansfield and Brody were killed in a car crash. Mansfield was decapitated. But the people who have seen her ghost roaming the pink mansion say that Mansfield looks better than ever. Obsessed by the death of his mother, actor Clifton Webb kept all her clothes and belongings locked behind a bedroom door. He continuously held seances to contact her. When the three-time Oscar winner died of a heart attack in October 1966, his mania continued. A firm believer in life after death, he vowed never to leave the house where he and his mother once lived. And he kept his promise. Webb hated cigarettes with a passion. And after his death, smokers in the house have been stunned when cigarette packets go flying across the room. Even lighting a cigarette becomes an impossible task when a mysterious cold breeze erupts from out of nowhere to blow out the flame. There is no doubt that cemeteries are a rich source of ghostly activity, and the cemeteries in Hollywood are the burial grounds for hundreds of stars. The first scandal to rock the glitzy service of Hollywood was that of Fatty Arbuckle and his involvement with actress Virginia Rapp. As the first actor to earn $1 million a year, Arbuckle was at the top of his career. Things couldn't get better. In fact, it didn't. At a typical Hollywood gala, Arbuckle and Virginia Rapp disappeared behind closed doors. Although officially Virginia Rapp died of a ruptured bladder, Arbuckle was tried three times for raping and killing her. Although acquitted, Arbuckle was nevertheless blacklisted from Hollywood and died a broken man. Buried in the Hollywood Memorial Cemetery is Virginia Rapp. Although not a star in Hollywood terms, 
Her death brought her the much sought after claim to stardom. There are claims that the sound of continuous sobbing can be heard coming from the direction of her grave. Perhaps the sobbing is from the grave next to her, which ironically holds the man who was left heartbroken after her murder. You see, Henry Lerman had a ring in his pocket and plans for their life together. Known as a girl who was too beautiful, silent screen star Barbara Lamar's life ended tragically from what doctors called overriding. Her funeral caused an uproar. Idolized by millions, her three-year career of stardom earned her a place in Hollywood history as the most beautiful woman who ever appeared before a movie camera. Many people today don't know who Barbara Lamar is, but a few witnesses claim that a beautiful woman mysteriously wanders around the area. She appears to be about 30 and is dressed to fit the 1920s fashion. Well, Barbara Lamar died in 1927. She was 30 years old at the time. Can you spot any evidence of supernatural phenomena in this photograph? In life, we tend to immortalize those who have reached that famed celebrity status. Stars whose every move can rate four-inch headlines as though they're somehow bigger than life. But rich or poor, famous or unknown, death makes no such distinction. And the mystery beyond awaits us all. I'm Patrick McNee. Thanks for being with me on Ghost Stories. Every day, Ghost Stories receives mail from viewers all over the country. Much of our correspondence contains comments on pieces that have been presented on the program. But often, viewers choose to include stories of their own personal encounters with ghosts, their photographs of ghosts, or sometimes they just have questions pertaining to supernatural phenomena. If you would like to share your own ghostly experiences, or if you have photographs or video you believe depicts an otherworldly presence, or would simply like to ask a question or comment on our show, please be sure to write us at Ghost Stories, Post Office Box 4190, Hollywood, California, 90078. That's Ghost Stories, Post Office Box 4190, Hollywood, California, 90078. And be sure to include a self-addressed stamped envelope for return of photos and videos.